Well, hi there. Today we're trying a little slightly different setup, a tripod. So you're looking down at me instead of up my nose. <laughs> I hope that works. Well, today we're going to talk about distillation. And I will show you some equipment and the like, but I want to really begin with a discussion of how and why distillation of alcohol first enters the picture. Um, because the scientists who discovered this process were definitely not looking for a recreational drug, okay? Nor were they primarily seeking a medicinal drug which they could use to heal infirmities and so on. Um, but these were incidental uses that, of course, came down the road, recreational, obviously. But to start with, the people who did this, the alchemists, were primarily searching for an elixir. Okay, that means something that is intended to extend the human lifespan. Alcohol was first and foremost a longevity drug, which is of course why we use the word um, the water of life to describe it, aquavit. Um, and I don't think that term was ever meant to be hyperbolic. That, that's literal, what, what, what it was for. So medieval scientists inherited two very distinct strands of thought that contributed to the experiments they conducted. One, of course, comes from the Judeo-Christian tradition, which posits that human beings, and in fact the entire Earth, are experiencing a gradual process of corruption from what was considered to be a pure, innocent, and Edenic state of perfection. Um, and to start with, humans in Eden, two of them, of course, <laughs> um, lived many, many years. Um, Adam beget Seth when he was 130 years old, and he continued to have children until he was 800. He only died when he was 930. Um, and of course, he doesn't set the record either. That was done by Methuselah, who lived 969 years. Now, the idea, later people, how they interpreted this incredible longevity, is that the further we get from these first forebears, chronologically, the fewer years we live. Um, and this doesn't just have to do with people, this has to do with the entire Earth is in a state of ongoing decay. So that, in fact, the herbs are less potent, the food much less nourishing and pure, and thus it actually becomes harder nowadays to live a really long time because we have a food that's not as nourishing, our digestive systems have to work harder, um, and we have, of course, become addicted to luxuries which weaken and enervate our bodies and um, and uh, you know the original people didn't have those and they didn't eat meat either of course now compounded with this is the idea that as time progresses we know less and less okay now that seems weird we tend to think the opposite way right we're going to know more in the future they used to think that adam knew everything in fact he named all the creatures and since that time, we have known less and less information about nature. So investigation is strangely primarily an attempt to recapture that original knowledge, the prisca scientia, the original wisdom, which we've been losing every generation. We um, forget things and forget what they mean and forget how to do them. So again, this is very, this is completely opposite from our very positive, positivist view which has held sway since the scientific revolution, the idea that every year we know more and more, we understand more, and we tend to look forward, right? We think the future is gonna be a better place. Um, to find the truth, the pre-modern scientist would have looked backward. I know, as strange as that sounds. So the reading of ancient mystical texts, things like the Hermetic Corpus, which were attributed to the ancient Egyptian Hermes Trismegistus, means thrice wise. They also tried in vain to read hieroglyphs. Um, they're, they're books that purport to actually understand them. They didn't, of, of course, until Champollion um, centuries later. But they, um, but they thought that these hieroglyphs represented the oldest written texts and thus were closest to the font of knowledge. And it's why alchemy, unlike chemistry, which comes from it, of course, takes on this kind of mystical and magical 
rather than empirical and scientific methodology. It is a matter of looking back and understanding arcane texts rather than running experiments and trying to discover new truths, okay? So again, the idea is the further we get from our origins, the more base, ignorant, and unhealthy is the human condition, and consequently the shorter our lifespan also. So by understanding these alchemical methods of manipulating nature, we might be able to replicate and speed up the natural process of transformation and devise a substance which, of course, could be very easily digested because it would be sort of pre-digested in a way. It would nourish the spirits in our brain more forcefully, more directly than, say, uh, you know, corrupt animal or vegetable manner. Uh, matter which which takes our energy right it saps the, the the whole process of digestion takes so much energy that imagine if you could have a process which pre-digests it right that's what all this alchemy is doing is just replicating processes that happen in nature in a laboratory um, imagine if it could do that pre-digestion for you and then you could get it the nutrients directly and immediately right so the scientists you know, thus had a very, um, they had a Judeo-Christian and a Greco-Roman foregrounding in their activities. So what they were trying to discover was essentially not the original tree of the knowledge of good and evil that you f find in Genesis, but the other tree. Remember, there are two of them. This is the tree of life. And remember, God had, in um, Genesis wonders after they eat from the tree of knowledge, what if now he reaches out his hand and takes from the tree of life also and eats it and then lives forever? That was, that's what God was afraid of, that they would, we would become immortal, we rebellious creations of his. So the very idea that, that such a substance could exist, it's in the Bible, it's there. There's a tree of eternal life also. Um, and I should not have to remind you that the words um, bear a strange similarity, vitis, which is grapes, and vita, which is life. Seems strange, right? Grapevine, life. So, moreover, in the Greek tradition, there is also an idea of a substance which could confer immortality. It's considered the food of the gods. Ambrosia is the food, nectar is the drink, and according to Pindar, a god who tasted human food would become immortal. Um, become mortal, sorry, and a mortal who ate human food would become divine and live forever. So, um, I think I have that backwards. What did I just write? A, a, uh, a mortal who ate godly food would become divine and live forever, right. So, now this is, of course, edging into very dangerous territory because it seems as if the, in, the original intention of God was to keep this fruit from humans. He said, don't eat from these, right? So there will be thinkers who consider this a kind of nefarious uh, activity, um, only possible with collusion of the devil. You know, think of this story of Dr. Faustus. He was this, he was a real person, a Renaissance alchemist, who made the mistake of conjuring Mephistopheles, and who then said, I'll give you wonderful powers, but you have to sell me your soul. And of course, the thing that he wants is immortality. Um, he has Helen of Troy dredged up, and in Marlowe's ver version, you know, when he sees Helen, he says, was this the face that launched a thousand ships and burnt the topless towers of Ilium? Sweet Helen, make me immortal with a kiss. <laughs> so, so if you're smart enough, however, to steer clear of demons like this, uh, the idea remains that prolongevity, uh, a drug that will create longer life, might be possible. Okay? And this is how it works. Okay? In Western medical thought, and this originates, of course, with the Greeks. The lifespan is directly related to what we would call lifestyle choices and diet. Okay? Hippocrates imagined that the life was sort of like a lamp. It slowly burns, it has fuel and a wick and flame, and the, these are the radical moisture, what he called, and the vital heat of the body. And as we age, we slowly spend this, um, and finally we grow colder and drier, and we are snuffed out, having consumed all of the body's fuel and the ability to replenish it with more food. We just don't have the energy to digest anymore. But normally, the fuel is replenished every day by the food and the beverages we consume. Remember, they replace the parts of our body. They are converted into our own substance. There's this term called assimilation. 
and but that takes energy right and in fact as we get older we have less and less energy to perform those functions so we get less nutritional value from our food we we have to eat less as we get older because we can't digest as much so we slowly kind of waste away this is how the Greeks explained it aging nonetheless physicians maintain the idea that by carefully controlling diet and exercise you could you could actually prevent this sort of premature wasting away of your body you could extend the lifespan interestingly enough by eating foods that are lighter and more digestible so you're and actually by reducing your intake strangely so as not to overburden the system if you get a lot of exercise and eat a lot of food and burn heavily you know you you die younger um, and the key to this was also eating foods that are more subtle by meaning that they are lighter in texture and they're more easily digested they pass through our system and become us more easily so the uh, so and the idea also is that like a fire the fuel should be proportionate to the flames intensity or it's suffocated so strangely the longevity the idea of longevity in the ancient world uh, in these regimens a regimen is a rule of things you do including diet exercise sleep sex things like that um, in this regimen involves eating less and getting less exercise that's gonna prevent you from aging too fast and some physicians recommend very interesting things like um, breast milk for elderly patients um, that is that is of course you know from the human breast and directly from the tap this is uh, this is in platina actually from the 1470 or even more intriguingly um, his colleague um, well his contemporary Marsilio Ficino a Platonist philosopher in Florence recommends sucking human blood directly from an open vein because it's pre-digested in a sense you get it from them and you it goes into your system and doesn't need that whole energy of conversion is the idea as sick as it may sound so the search for a longevity drug something more concentrated and and powerfully nourishing um, has a long conceptual history it's been around for a while and and as well as a tradition the, by tradition there's also a place where you could find this longevity drug um, without uh, and it's a place where people live closer to their pristine state they live more attuned to nature um, they don't have the corrupting influence of civilization and in fact when uh, Ponce de Leon was searching for the fountain of youth in Florida in the early 16th century um, that was not a ridiculous idea and he was really looking for that he thought you know this is a place where the Native American people um, Indians he thought were um, didn't have civilization to corrupt them they ate pure food they weren't greedy they didn't fight wars he thought they do of course but um, but he thought that's where the fountain of youth is going to be found this these um, and there was a, in fact a debate in Rome at the time that concluded of course there could be miraculous waters that restore life much as there are healing waters at holy sites people would go to places to drink the holy water and get healed um, and of course there's the idea that if you could find the Holy Grail and drink wine directly from it you would become immortal okay you've all seen Raiders of the Lost Ark right that's the idea that's what that that old knight is doing back there in the cave with the with the real grail right he drank from it so when alchemists turn their energies toward discovering this water of life it, it is not ridiculous and it's not entirely blasphemous either um, this is something that they had to address of course um, Roger Bacon uh, was very explicit about this um, he said careful diet can extend life and I'll, I'll quote here only by a certain degree but experimental art supplies the defect of medicine in this particular so again he's thinking by replicating the forces that are already active in nature for how you concentrate your vital essences uh, of natural material you could increase their therapeutic force you could create this elixir okay that's that's a, of course an Arabic word um, it, it comes it's actually pre Arabic it comes from Greek the word zerion with an X and then in Arabic it becomes al ixir X E R I O N and then I K S E E R and then we get the word elixir from this so the alchemist was really thinking all he's doing is concentrating and harnessing these forces that are already present in nature 
um, using procedures which people used to know in the past, and they're now long forgotten by mortals. This is this is maybe where the idea that that you know Zosimus was doing alchemy and had invented the uh, still. It may just be their wish that that yeah, ancient Egypt. That's where it has to come from, right? So, but in any case, in the 12th century in Europe, this becomes an obsession for a few figures. Uh, Roger Bacon is one of them, uh, Arnold of Villanova, and Raymond Lull. Okay, Raymond, they're um, Roger's English, Arnold and Raymond are uh, Catalan they're from Spain. So Roger, let's start with Roger Bacon. He's a, an Oxford alchemist, and he contended that the critical event um, in human history was the flood, and that washed over all the material of the earth, making everything, changing the humoral quality of everything so that it's watery, phlegmatic, and actually less nutritious. And that's the reason now that we can't live a vegetable diet anymore. It's why we have to eat meat, even though it is much harder to digest and assimilate, to turn into our substance. So the, this is how he explains why we live shorter lives now, is we've got to eat this much cruder material, which is not very nutritious anymore, and, um, and is, taxes our systems. So the idea is that on this diet of meat, we produce offspring that every generation become a little weaker and a little weaker and live fewer years, in fact. And he believed that if you use the alchemical arts, you could actually restore our original longevity. Um, and he's pointing again to people way back in the past, but he says there's a guy named Artefius who lived for 1,025 years, and he wrote a book called the Clavis Sapientia, um, which means the, uh, the nail of wisdom, I think that's what it means, or Liber Secretus, the secret book. So, so again, they're thinking that these old books written by people way in the past that knew how to get this elixir, and then they could take it and live longer, okay? So Roger starts experimenting, okay? We don't t tend to think of medieval people as running experiments, but he did. Um, and these were things that he believed were incorruptible substances, things that you don't see in nature decaying and falling apart, so maybe they're good for your body too. And you can probably guess what those things are to start with is gold. Remember, gold doesn't rust, it doesn't corrode, stays bright, and he, in his mind, um, connected it sympathetically to the sun. Okay, sympathy means to vibrate with, to generate, so, so gold actually harnesses the force of the sun in a weird way. So what he was trying to formulate is something that is called aurum potabile, drinkable gold. Um, and the idea was that if it doesn't corrupt outside of your body, it's going to make your body incorruptible by some degree. Also, um, if you think, you're probably thinking of Goldschläger right now, right? The little gold flakes that float around in, in bad schnapps. Well, that's, that's the modern equivalent. That's exactly what it is. Um, other things that they believed were incorruptible, like stag's heart. I mean, it's a deer. I'm, I have no idea why they thought that was incorruptible. Uh, pearls, which are actually very corruptible. You can put them in vinegar. They'll, they'll dissolve. Um, coral, aloe, ambergris. Um, I don't know why they thought any of this stuff was incorruptible, but they did. And so this, so he starts experimenting with these things. Um, and um, the idea is that they're going to confer on you some kind of super energy. Uh, he also believed that the breath of a virgin would do the same. I, I assume administered mouth to mouth, but I, I don't know, honestly. Um, but what they're doing, they're also trying to search for this this object that is made in an alchemical lab, it's called the Philosopher's Stone. It is a usually a piece of, well, the ones that have come down to us are usually basalt that's highly polished, and it's sort of a mirror that you can see into the future and tell, you know, all sorts of interesting things. But in any case, Bacon said this is the secret of secrets, the most noble matter, which transforms body in their essence, fortifies them in their virtue, which makes an old man young and drives out all sickness from the body. Okay? Now, as you can imagine, what they're eventually gonna get to experimenting on is something that is an analog of blood. Okay? It's similar to it in substance and qualities. And of course, that's wine, okay? They're, they're not, they're just playing with it because they're trying to make a longevity drug. And they figure if you could get the, since wine transforms into blood in our body, if you could do that process of transformation 
get it to be its essence in the lab, well, maybe that would be the water of life. Maybe if you could turn it into those kind of spirits that are already in our brain, going, you know, moistening it and, and informing it, um, then you might have that secret elixir. So, so the school of Salerno, this is the 12th century. This is um, between 1130 and 1160. It's, um, it's really the oldest university. Um, it doesn't have a charter. Bologna does that uh, first, but, but it's, it's a medical school, really. Um, they are credited with the earliest recorded experiments on distilling alcohol. Okay, there's, there's definitely stills before this, but it's the first time that, that they write down, we're using wine, we're making alcohol, which, and Salerno in this period was one of the centers of translation of those Arabic scientific texts. Remember those texts that were translated from Greek into Arabic? They're now being translated from Arabic into Latin. Okay, so, um, so, this is, so it makes perfect sense that this old medical school, uh, the first u real university in Europe, um, starts doing it. So, so by the 1270s, uh, this technique of distillation of alcohol spread to Bologna, and Bologna is actually the first formal university with a charter and professors and students and everything. Um, it's still in operation today, I should mention. Um, so consider... I guess what, what I really want to say is that the foundations of the university are directly connected with making booze. That's ironic, isn't it? <laughs> okay. So physicians there contended that this new water or of life, since it was humorally extremely hot and burning, could be used for all cold disorders in their system, which is allopathic, allopathic. A-L-L-O-pathic means you cure things with their opposite. Remember, you have a hot and moistest temperature, you cure with something that's cold and dry and vice versa, right? You cure with opposites. That's all allopathic means. Um, so they're figuring that um, something like apoplexy, which is their word for a stroke, uh, paralysis, trembling, anything cold, so including a cough, a cold, whatever, um, that these would be cured with the hot and burning alcohol. And think about that the next time you take something like uh, NyQuil, still mostly alcohol, believe it or not. They also soon discovered that plants could be infused in the alcohol and give it their virtues, right? Many things, like an herb, if you put in water, nothing will happen. You put it in alcohol, the essential oils will come out and you can, or you can even distill it with the alcohol and get super concentrated. Um, you know, herbal flavors. And so, so we have several different things to start with. We have pure aqua vita. We have a version with herbs that's distilled called aqua vita composite, which means composite. It's, it's composed of lots of different things. And then you have a version which is redistilled. And you can do this several times to get higher alcohol concentration. This would be called perfectissima, which means the most pure essence or water of life. So the physician Taddeo Alderotti, he's 1223 to 1303. He's at Bologna. At the end of this um, book he wrote called the Concilia Medicinalia, which is kind of case studies of medicine, he gives a disti very, dis very uh, distinct process, uh, description of the process of distillation. And in another book, his De Virtutibus Aqua Vitae, the virtues of booze, um, he describes the process whereby you take off 30% of the distilled wine, you redistill it, that's a process called rectification, in fact it still is today, um, and that you can get your alcohol up to about 90%. So this is above, say, Everclear that you'd buy. You almost never see 100% alcohol anywhere, but it's very, very high that he's getting. His contemporary, uh, Theodoro, Theodoricus, okay, or Theo, Teodorico Borgognoni, who's uh, 1205 to 1298, also composed a, 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 a treatise on surgery, and he describes alcohol and how it drives away white hair, we have to try that, uh, brings back youth, improves memory, makes you cheerful and happy, um, and he recommends a daily dose. So. Uh, he's my hero. So again, alcohol is, again, still a, a longevity drug. That's what it is, first and foremost. 
So the other two names <clears throat> associated with this early distillation period of what we're calling is aqua vitae, water of life, are Arnold of Villanova, who I mentioned, and uh, Raymond Lull. Lull, by tradition, is Villanova's pupil. Okay, so Arnold is 1235 to 1311, and he wrote a whole book on uh, called the Liber de Vinis, which means the Book of Wines. He was uh, Catalan, which is, you know, the east coast of current-day Spain, Barcelona's in Catalonia. Um, born about 1240, and very became a very, very famous physician. He treated, gosh, popes and kings. He became a professor at the University of Montpellier. And he wrote a book called De Conservation Juventute, The Conservation of Youth, about 1290. And he writes an explicit encomium to alcohol as the restorer of youth. And he presented a lot of evidence in its favor also. He said, um, you know, look at, just run some simple experiments. If you take meat or fruit and you put it in alcohol, it is conserved indefinitely. Interesting. Um, and he said, presumably, you put alcohol in your body, it's going to do the same thing. It will preserve you. Arnold also insisted that alcohol, I'll quote here, eases diseases come, coming from cold. It comforts the heart. It heals all old and new sores on the head. It causes a good color in a person. It eases pain in the teeth, causes sweet breath. He uh, heals the short-winded causes good digestion and appetite, takes away belching, eases the yellow jaundice, the dropsy, the gout, the pain in the breasts when they're swollen, and heals all diseases in the bladder. It even heals the bite of a mad dog. And it gives you courage in a young person and causes him to have good memory. <laughs> I don't know where he got that evidence to support that, but in any case, he's thinking it's an aid to memory because, of course, the spirits are moving quickly around your brain. It's going to give, make, give you uh, quicker intellect. So Raymond Lull was another alchemist, uh, born in Mallorca, which is an island off the coast of Spain, and moved, uh, moved a lot around Europe. Um, Montpellier, Paris, Genoa, ends up in Tunis for a while. So in any case, he is credited for developing a system of alchemical symbols. Uh, so the letter I, for example, would stand for spirits. K would stand for the alembic, the still itself. R for sublimation. Uh, L for digestion. And apparently he also devised the idea that, that you can double distill something for extra strength and, and showed you how to do it. Uh, Lull describes aquavitae as an element newly revealed to man but hid from antiquity because the human race was then too young to need this beverage which was destined to revive the energies of modern decrepitude. So it's not that the people, old people in the past knew everything, but now we have a need of this, so we invented this procedure, which will help us regain um, old age. Eventually, the name that is associated with this stuff um, is quintessence, the fifth essence. Um, John of Rupesissa is the one who says that this is, if you can get wine, and distill it seven times, you get the fifth element, which is absolutely incorruptible. And of course, he's right. Alcohol is incorruptible. If you take alcohol, put it in a glass jar, and make sure it doesn't evaporate, it will, you know, that's the angel share, you will, um, it will never change, ever. Um, it can age, the flavor changes a little, because there's, a, you know, if it's not 100%, there's always other compounds in there. Um, but, but alcohol really never goes bad. Just so, you, just so you know, if something that's, that's that high, if you have a bottle of whiskey in a bottle for, you know, 100 years, it's fine. So Arnold even says there is undoubtedly something to be said for inebriation, inasmuch as the results, which usually follow, do purge the body of noxious humors. So he's thinking the one time really getting sick is going to flush your system out of totally or something strange like that. So, so you have to imagine what happens is that this um, liquor, let's just use that term, began to be used a little more widely. People eventually would have caught on to the fact, within a generation or two, of course, that it doesn't extend life, that, that there's you know no real correlation at all. But your doctor might prescribe it for your cold, 
or um, and of course they're not going to pass up a lucrative source of revenue. They 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 would any good physician or pharmacist would have a still could make you up a batch of this stuff or would have it in his counter and you know be able to sell you a bottle. And is he going to alienate this source of revenue? I don't think so. So what happens is alcohol makes this gradual transformation from something that is purely a medicine to something that is a recreational drug that people want and are gonna look for a reason to purchase, right? Whether they manufacture that reason, you know, um, like many people do today, I assume for medical marijuana, that's the same process, right? Um, and what's interesting is that the pharmaceutical herbs that were supposed to lend it very specific medicinal qualities well, it turns out they taste really good, right? And you can mix them in interesting ways and use them just for flavoring, you know? Cinnamon tastes really good in it. Um, uh, juniper berries taste really, really good in alcohol. So I don't want to, I'll come to these later, of course, but, and I don't want to overstate this case, but the appearance of distilled spirits completely changes the game when we talk about the social and cultural meaning of drink. This is the turning point in history. It's the turning point in the course, in fact, is that wine and beer really are only gonna get you up to about 15%, 10 at most for anything you can make out of beer, right? And it's a beverage that, both of these are beverages that in all likelihood, you'll pass out before you get violently drunk or, and it would be very, very hard to kill yourself on wine, right? Um, I think. Um, in great volumes, yes, you can get drunk, you can get sick, whatever. But think of how much more easily it can be done with something that's 40 or 50% alcohol that you just go and you get the same amount as you do in a whole mug of beer, right? It's a very different substance. And think of also the ramifications of this in terms of the economy because it's much easier to transport a barrel of brandy than it is a barrel of beer. And the beer may go bad, brandy's never gonna go bad, ever. And in fact, it's gonna pick up really nice flavor from the barrel too, and turn brown. Um, so I think this, this kind of transition, it happens in the late Middle Ages, of course. Um, it's evident all over the place when you get to the 14th, 15th century, uh, that people are no longer really thinking of it as medicine. They're beginning to think, this stuff is great, let's just manufacture it and sell it. Um, let me give you an example. This is a, one of my authors, in fact, a Ferraris guy named Giovanni Michele Savonarola. His dates are 1384 to 1464. Um, you may recognize his name, Savonarola. He's the grandfather or maybe grand uncle of the infamous Renaissance reformer who was burned at the stake eventually in, in Florence in the Renaissance. So anyway, this is, this is an ancestor of his. So Savonarola gives you a description of the distilling equipment in a book called the Libella de Aqua Ardenti. Ardent just means burning. So this is burning water is what he calls it. Um, he gives a description of this coiled tube, a, a serpentine tube that's used for cooling the steam that comes off the, the boiling wine. And um, in English, it's called a worm because that's the way it swirls around. And the thing that it's held in, usually a bucket of cold water, is called the worm tub. Um, nowadays, you can use ice. I usually use ice. Um, so again, but he actually repeats and says, yeah, this is a pro-longevity medicine if you take it in moderation. And the composite versions have various other medicinal applications that could be heating or cooling or whatever. Um, but they're really good for warding off the plague. Because remember, plague was considered to be um, uh, corruption within the body. And that if you... In added something which staves off corruption, uh, as it does, right, you know, anywhere you use it outside the body, then you could prevent plague if you drink alcohol. He also says, how pitiable are those people who take it simply as a cure for indigestion? Meaning, I think he's implying that they're just taking it for pleasure. They go to the physician and say, I have a stomach ache. Can you give me some, some brandy? <laughs> and I'll be much better. Um, in other words, the fact that distillation was by then widespread and well-known means you can purchase it under any pretext whatsoever. And you don't need a license. You just go to your physician and say, I want some, some brandy. Um, I'll, I'll talk about what, what, where that word brandy comes from. It's not around yet. We should be saying aquavit, technically. 
Um, but it meant that, you know, because of the availability, it's, it's bound to be a, a drunk just for fun. Okay? People start doing that. And by the 15th century, they also discovered that the process of distillation you can use on any alcoholic beverage at all. You can distill beer into a kind of crude whiskey. Um, is a, is a, or is a, uh, just a Celtic translation of that word, water of life. Um, mead you can distill, and I don't know really why no one really does that anymore. Um, it's very nice, and actually I've done it a few times from honey that was oddly in the wall in my laundry room. I had hives of bees, not intentionally, and a guy came out and uh, removed them and took them somewhere else. They're actually living somewhere else now, but he gave me several honeycombs, and I pressed the honey out and made mead and then distilled it, and God, was that stuff good. Um, in any case, uh, and you can distill anything. If you can get alcohol out of uh, potatoes, you know, that doesn't happen way down until way down the road, 18th century, but you can get vodka out of it. Um, you can even just f take sugar water, um, add yeast, have it ferment into what's really, really nasty stuff. But once you distill it, you have rum, right? Or you can use even the, the leftover molasses from, from uh, sugar making which is, uh, so, so all these things are about to come together. I don't want to jump the gun. We'll, we'll get there when we get to the 17th century. All these new distilled beverages uh, come from the disco original discovery of distilling wine. But the, and the common word, actually, let me tell you now, for just uh, so you understand what I'm talking about, brandy, the word comes from the word brandtewein. It's Dutch. The Dutch actually perfect dist distillation. Um, and uh, brandewein just means burned wine. Okay, so it it's goes on the fire, it's burned in a sense. It's also discovered in this period that you can take some of this, uh, and it's and the way we use brandy today, incidentally, is that once it goes into an oak cask, it turns brown, and it picks up the flavor from that. It's distinguished from eau de vie, which is the water of life in French, or aquavite, which is clear distilled uh, wine. Okay, that's the only the only difference between those two things. Um, but in any case, it's also discovered that if you take some of this, this um, water of life and you add it to wine, you fortify it, you've increased its shelf life almost indefinitely. Um, you've made it much, much more stable to ship. So we get things like port and sherry and vermouth, and, um, and which is flavored with herbs also. You can, and then they start experimenting with lots of different flavors. You know, the juniper, what, is, what does that give you? gin, right? The earliest gins are 15th, 16th century. Uh, so there's this whole world of new drinks. Let me just, just leave it there and we'll, I'll devote separate lectures to each of them, in fact. But for the moment, uh, think of the, the threat to the social order that these drinks pose in the minds of late medieval and early modern legislators. <clears throat> right? So think, think of the, all the licensing efforts we talked about last time regarding beer. So all the authorities are kind of uh, trying to control consumption by restricting the licenses they grant to uh, give uh, the, the licenses to distill to a very few guilds. They're trying to really control what people drink, right? Uh, and by taxing alcohol, we've, we've, of course, we're in the business of doing that ever since then. They believe they could prevent public drunkenness, right? Or drunkenness in general, in fact. And I think they were kind of conflicted because on the one hand, they don't want to limit a source of great revenue for the state, right? They could be taxing all this stuff and making money. But ironically, by the end of the 16th century, especially in England, they're thinking maybe we should just let whoever wants distill and tax it and get revenue from it. And as long as they pay the fee, who cares, right? So 1621, the London Company of Distillers were founded and 200 distillers are, are admitted into it, uh, producing aqua vitae, aqua composita, and other strong and hot waters, as they called them. In France, Louis XII started licensing makers of eau de vie in 1537. The French distillers got their own guild in the mid-16th century. In Spain, the state began to control the distilling industry in 1590. So I just want you to realize that the state's intervention into alcohol much like its intervention into firearms, um, is very old. It comes back, it goes way back to the 
um, to the early modern period. Another consideration is that the base from which you distill alcohol, note that doesn't actually have to be very good, right? Or it doesn't even have to be drinkable. You, as long as you have alcohol in that thing, once you distill it, all the junk is gonna be left behind. You're just gonna be getting the alcohol out of it, especially if you still distill it a couple of times, it'll become pretty pure. So you can start to ferment things that are not beer or wine or mead or something that's actually drinkable, but just a crude kind of version of those. So you can actually ferment any grain whatsoever, right? Rye, corn, when we discover that, um, potatoes. You could ferment leftover grape skins, which is used to make grappa. And actually, you can, f you can distill, ferment and distill any fruit in a way that you really can't make. I mean, you can, you can distill cider apples into pears, cherries, anything at all will um, make a decent distillate in the end because you're taking the alcohol off and if you do it properly actually you keep the flavor like you think of Kirschwasser and, or, um, or Poir Guillaume which is made of pears. So, the, um, so what's interesting is because of these regulations the price of alcohol drops precipitously. It happens all over the place at the same time suddenly there's tons of alcohol and it's cheap and instead of being made on a small scale by physicians or even women, as of course was the case with beer, it's not hard to have a little still in your house, and very simple in fact, um, the production immediately ramps up to provide massive quantities of cheap booze. In the course of the 16th, 17th century, suddenly alcohol is available to everyone. And so this is the point I want to make here. For the first time in human history, alcohol consumption can actually become a major social problem. Because, you know, beer, you have to drink a whole lot. And people are used to it, actually. And it's not very high alcohol. Wine, wine drinking countries tend not to be really heavy drinkers. But when you get alcohol distilled, it's very easy to abuse, right? Very easy to get blind, stinking drunk, literally. And to, uh, and because it's cheap to depend on it and, and use it all the time, you know, not just to refresh your body or to, you know, eat with a meal. So the nature of alcohol really changes here dramatically. Um, I'll give you a quote to back this point up. In 1493, a physician in Nuremberg wrote this. In view of the fact that everyone at present has got into the habit of drinking aquavitae, it's necessary to remember that the quantity one can permit oneself to drink and learn to drink it according to one's capacities if one wants to behave like a gentleman. So don't drink a pint of it, you'll be in trouble, okay? So all this again happens late 15th, early 16th century and it coincides with the Reformation. I think that's very important. So the diatribes against demon alcohol, this is where they begin to proliferate, right? They are the direct and ancestors of the teetotaling tracts we'll see when we get to the 19th and 20th centuries. And in places that have a particularly puritanical bent, think of Calvinist Geneva, think of 17th century England in the age of the Puritans, um, they start thinking we need to either shut the taverns or very strictly control drinking. Um, and who can drink in them how? Um, they start to ban sales of alcohol on Sunday direct outgrowth of Reformation efforts to control. And it's not only Protestant countries, I should men mention also. It's Catholic Reformation era also. For example, in Augsburg, they started taxing distillers in 1472. In 1496, bans on sale of alcohol on Sunday followed in Nuremberg, in Munich in 1506. And this is, and this is actually before the Reformation, notice, just before it. Um, or they start to regulate when distilled alcohol can be consumed. And interestingly, um, what, what really surprises me, and, and it's kind of funny, is the custom, it seems, in the early 16th century, was to start your day with a shot. Okay, you wake up, and remember, there's no coffee or tea yet, right? So you have your sh a shot of, of strong liquor when you w wake up in the morning. Um, so that some of the customs actually banned consumption in the evening. They would close down the places you could buy alcohol or drink it publicly 
um, in the evening because they assumed, okay, it's all right if people drink in the morning to get them up. <laughs> it's really, I love that. It's just that our value system has just changed entirely, right? Morning is for working and for caffeine, right? So let me give you the attitude of a physician. This is William Vaughn in the early 17th century. It's very typical. He says, among the abuses of our times, um, he hates smoking. He writes a whole diatribe against it. He says, also, there is the use of burning liquors, which are brewed by our vilipendious Vulcans. Remember, Vulcan is the forge, god of forges. Nor for any lasting use, but to beguile the lustful world with desperate receipts and momentary cures. So notice, it's very funny. He, He's not denying it is a cure, right? But he says that, um, you know, if, you, if it's medicine, I totally understand. But if it's if you're drinking it for pleasure, then that's abuse. Very interesting, isn't it? So the spread of distillation also owes a great deal to the invention of the printing press. That's the mid 15th century. All of a sudden, you can just buy a manual on distillation. You purchase a little equipment and you just get going. Okay, it's, it's really, none of it is very, very technical or um, complicated. So the, um, the Viennese physician, Michael Puff von Schreck, I love that name, it's P-U-F-F, Puff von Schreck, wrote the first printed book on distillation. Tiny little track that he wrote in the 50, 1450s, it comes into print in the 1470s. So this is really among the very first books printed anyway, anywhere, right? It's called Ein Guts Nüchlich Büchlin von der Ausgesprenten Wasser. Um, <clears throat> good new little book on the uh, distillation of waters. And it's got 82 different herbal liquors. And this thing is so popular, it gets printed all through the next century in 38 editions. So it's, it's, a, it's good, but it is not the bestseller. The bestseller and the most popular of uh, distillation books is by a guy named Hieronymus Braunschweig. Okay, B-R-A-U-N-S-C-H-W-E-I-G, Hieronymus Braunschweig, the Liber de Arte Distillandi, Simplicia et Composite, which means um, art of distilling symbols and composed medicines, printed in 1500, and it has all the technical details, all the drawings, numerous recipes for essential oils that you'd use as medicine, and of course it's got aqua vitae in it. Um, and what makes it also enormously helpful and popular is it's translated into the vernacular languages. So it becomes a major source for Europeans breaking into the business of distilled spirits, um, whether it's for pleasure or whether it's for um, medicine. If you all really want to think, hmm, how do I open up a business and make a killing, buy this cheap little book spend what is the equivalent of a few hundred dollars on a still. That's actually how much one costs now. I think mine I bought for about $250. Um, and then get distilling. You just boil the water, the steam rises up as long as it stays under a hundred and um, uh, hundred degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, not boil the water, boil the wine, right? The water will stay in the bottom. The, the steam of the alcohol will go up and as it goes around the neck, it will cool and go down this coil into the bucket of cold water with the, the coil, and then it turns back into water, into liquid, and then you've got alcohol. Very, very simple. I'll show you uh, various stills online. Um, and we'll look at Hieronymus Braunschweig also. He's available online in the uh, biodiversitylibrary.org. Okay, that's where we'll look. The whole book is there. So. Let me give you a typical recipe of this period, because they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, this is called Dr. Stevens Water, which ultimately comes from a, uh, an author named Charles Etienne in the early 16th century. He's a great, fun author. And um, just so you understand what we're talking about, grains of paradise are Malagueta pepper. They come from the west coast of Africa. So take a gallon of Gascoigne wine, that's from uh, Bordeaux, or south of there, maybe, the Gascony is that region. Uh, ginger, galengal, which is a relative of wine, a relative of ginger. It's a little spicier and more mustardy, and if you've had uh, you know, Thai food, it's those roots that are sliced up in your tum sum soup. Um, cinnamon, nutmegs, grains, which are those grains of paradise, aniseed, fennel seed, caraway seed, of each a dram, sage, red mint, red roses, thyme, pellitory, which is an herb, rosemary, wild thyme, chamomile, and lavender of each a handful. 
So he says, beat the spices small and bruise the herbs. Just bruising, you don't want to crush them. Let them macerate 12 hours, stirring now and then, and distill them by an alembic or copper still, which is refrigeratory, meaning it has that cooling chamber, right? And keep the first pint by itself, the second by itself. And I'll explain a little bit of, of the, the, the tops and tails and what the, how the distilling process changes as it goes through. Um, so he says the first pint will be hotter, the second stronger of the ingredients. Um, and he says this water is known to comfort all the principal parts. Um, and uh, there are other very interesting books you can look at, like The London Distiller is great. So let me read you a bit of that. So to show the um, prevalent idea of distillation as a form of preservation, not only of wine, but of the human body, let's look at the, just a little touch of uh, literature here. And um, no one less than Shakespeare himself gives us an example. Uh, I think among Shakespeare's favorite references and um, one with which very few people are, are familiar today, um, but sure, certainly they would have been in the past, is this idea of distillation. He talks about it a lot in several different places. So the technique, of course, connected to alchemy and magic and so on, but more often was among these things that in Shakespeare's day, gentlemen would buy a still and make their own medicinal waters for the household and experiment with various herbs and sometimes they'd even cook, which is very interesting. Uh, John Evelyn in the early 17th century. Uh, um, well, actually, um, um, uh, Sir Kenelm Digby is a very good example of these gentlemen tinkerers in the kitchen with distilling stuff. So in any case, um, uh, they would, of course, have been using herbs and spices, but all just as often flowers. So let me give you Sonnet 5, which remarks about this process. Flower, but flowers distilled, though they with winter meet, less but their show, their substance still live sweet. So you're distilling the essence of the flower, and the regular flower is going to die, um, but uh, like, like the beautiful bloom of a young woman that's that's what he compares in the sonnet but the um but you can distill its essence so he says i want to distill your essence babe and so it's very funny actually uh, or in sonnet six he says let not winter's ragged hand deface in thee thy summer ere thou be distilled make some sweet vial treasure thou some sweet place with beauty's treasure ere it be self-killed meaning that with age, you're going to age and your beauty is going to be gone. But if you could distill your beauty like the essence of a flower, then it would remain incorruptible. And uh, you could put it in a little vial in some treasured place. It's just, it's a lovely, weird metaphor of turning humans into, into alcohol, I guess. But, um, but like other metaphors, these refer to the power of preservation above anything, right? So, and also concentrating to the essence to get its, you know, particular qualities, which would, in this case would be youth, freshness, aroma, and it will last through the season. So um, in a similar uh, passage in A Midsummer Night's Dream, Theseus says this, but earthier happy is the rose distilled than that which withering on the virgin thorn grows, lives, and dies in single blessedness. So the rose becomes happier because it's lasting in distilled rose water than if it just lives briefly and dies and disappears. Um, and there are also references to other distilled things. Carduus Benedictus is mentioned in uh, Much Ado. Um, and you could also think the, um, you remember in the scene in Romeo and Juliet where the monk gives a poison um, that's not gonna kill her, but will make it look like she's dead and, um, and then she'll awake. It's distilled. Right, that's a liquor distilled to feign death. Um, distilled waters also are used to balm the head in the taming of the shrew. So it's it's all over Shakespeare. That's my my point, and it's all over, of course, all literature of that period uh, that people like to drink um, alcohol now. Um, and it's and certainly Shakespeare was familiar with this procedure. You know, we've probably seen it somewhere. And it seems that the you know the interesting metaphors that play on the double meaning of distillation as preservative and concentration of your essence. That's, that's really what's at play there. Um, so I guess we will, um, I'll come back and 
we'll talk about all the other forms of liquor, but I guess in class what I really want to do is I want to go into a little detail about the distillation process and um, what makes it so interesting. Why, on the one hand, it's actually very, very simple to do. On the other hand, to do well and to get things that are have the terpenes removed and all the nasty flavors um, takes not science but art, real art. You really just need to know what you're doing and um, to, to make a really, really fine spirit. Okay, we'll talk about that in the coming lectures. See ya.